welcome everyone. I know we're uh, looking forward to discussing licensure this evening with our panelists and with you all. Um, as Corinne mentioned, I'm Lauren Coles. I'm a senior associate at Co-Architects and the vice chair uh, of the AIA LA Practice Committee. You know, in addition to being a licensed architect, I also act as licensing supervisor at my office, Co-Architects, and I provide mentorship and guidance on the license licensure process to ARE candidates at our firm. You know, achieving a license is um, to practice architecture is a completely massive effort. Uh, after schooling, a candidate must clock months of experience under a licensed architect and then pass six national exams and one extra special California exam. <laughs> so this panel of three um, consisting of licensed architects and in pursuit of licensure candidates will share their personal journeys to licensure, discuss how leadership can support candidates and share study plans. So overall, we hope that this panel will support and strengthen pathways to licensure while demystifying the process. So now I'd like to introduce our panelists and if we could maybe um, get pinned on the screen now, that would be great. Um, so we have Barbara Aguire, Sam Piper and Matthew Trotter. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> hey, everyone. Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. Good to see you. <laughs> um, so I guess we'll just kick this off. Barbara, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So hi, everyone. My name is Barbara Aguirre. I am a project coordinator at AC Martin. I recently graduated from USC with a master's in architecture. I did my undergrad in mechanical engineering, and I started my path to licensure, I believe, eight months ago in December of 2022. Currently, I have taken three exams. I started with the hardest one um, for me, which was PA. I'll get into a little bit about that later. Um, and then took that twice and took practice management once. And I have not passed a single exam. So I'm currently in pursuit of my license and in that whole process. Sam, would you like to tell us about yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. So I'm Sam Piper. I work as a medical planner, uh, medical equipment planner for a consulting firm called Criterion. I have recently passed all six of my NCARB exams. And in a few short days, I'm going to be taking my California supplementary exam. So right up to the finish line here. Uh, and it's all very fresh in my mind right now. But uh, I am the BIM team lead at my firm. And uh, yeah, just excited to share what I have. That's great. Thank you for being here. And Matthew? Hello, all. My name is Matthew Trotter. Um, I am a project architect and project designer at Cunningham in Culver City. Uh, I also am a past SoCal NOMA uh, board member as well as the founder of the developing professional group there. Uh, I also am a licensed uh, architect in the state of California, and I uh, got my license in 2021. So I'm excited to be here, and um, hopefully I'm able to share some, some nuggets with, with everyone. That's helpful. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank you all for being here. I guess we can kick it off with our first question, which is what inspired you to start the AXP and ARE journey? I guess, Sam, if you could maybe kick us off on that one. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, getting licensed was always the end goal for me. Um, and I felt like after graduating from Cal Poly in 2017, I didn't want to wait too long. I had joined up in my AIA chapter in Orange County, uh, there was study groups that would meet up after work and just meeting with those people and talking with them all made it feel much more possible to get involved and start studying and start uh, signing up to take the exams. And yeah, I guess that was my first real step into the process. That's great. <clears throat> 
Barbara, what made you um, start start the AXP and ARE journey? Yeah, so for me, early on, I always knew I wanted to be like a PA, so a project architect. So I knew that license, you know, was part of it. Like it was something that I was going to have to do in my career. Uh, what I guess made me want to start so early on, uh, because I just recently graduated, was exactly that. Um, I've heard a lot of advice from current people that had taken the exams or people that had taken it a long time ago. And the one piece of feedback that I always got was um, usually it would always be like, oh, I wish I would have started sooner, like something closer to school, because you still have those like study habits in place. You're used to studying. You're not just used to work. And so I didn't want to let go of those study habits. And so I just kind of wanted to keep the ball rolling and just kind of start off as soon as I could. Um, and then AXP, AXP hours, I've been working towards probably since I started architecture back in 2018 and just with internships. And so I always knew I wanted to be licensed. I guess it was always just get my hours as fast as possible so then I can start testing as fast as possible. And yeah, just didn't really want to lose those study habits was the biggest thing after graduating. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that, I mean, studying for the exams is one thing and practicing architecture is another. So I think it's smart that you, you know, got that advice um, in terms of, you know, it is a test. Uh, it's not like being at work. And so there is a lot of similarities to being in school. I don't know, Matthew, what, what inspires you to start the process? Well, I, similar to Sam, I, I think I always knew that I wanted to be, a, be an architect. And um, I think I was seven years old. My dad was a, a cabinet maker. He was working at a, a doctor's house um, who lived in a house that Paula Williams designed. His uh, granddaughter lived right next door. And he happened to have uh, one of uh, Paula Williams' books of all of his work. And uh, the, the doctor was was showing my dad around the house and showing our, the archways and things like that. And he actually gave the book to my dad. My dad got it signed by Paula Williams' granddaughter and he brought it home and gave it to me. I read the thing from cover to book in. It was incredible. It was awesome. Uh, but I told my dad, I said, this is awesome, but I can't do this. Because um, looking at what Paula Williams had to go through to become an architect, it was ridiculous. Like he, he had his structural license, he had his architectural license, and he, he still was having trouble as a, as a black male in Los Angeles getting work and being seen similarly in a similar fashion to his white counterparts. And um, he even was drawing upside down uh, away from his white clients so that they would feel comfortable. So he learned how to draw upside down. I just told my dad, I can't do this. I'm not doing that. I'm not drawing upside down. I'm not doing all this. I would, would like to avoid all of this. And my dad was like, don't worry about it. You can do it. No matter what issues that you have, you can do it. And so when I think about um, not only what got me into it, but what keeps me going is everybody has their hardships. You know, there's different intersectionalities of minority or whether you're white, whether you're Asian, whatever your gender is or sexuality, whatever those things are that make you you, there's going to be obstacles in the way. And I think one of the things that kept pushing me along and one of the things I hope I can impart to you all, no matter who you are, that know that whatever issues you're facing, someone else has dealt dealt with those same issues they're either dealing with them right now or they've dealt with them before and they've come before you and there's people that came before you that dealt with even more difficult issues and so I think about that a lot of times that even though there may be things I feel that may be against me or there may be issues that I think that need to change if you want something you still got to push and strive for it or you'll never get it and so that kind of helped me continue to push because I felt that I needed to and I need to set an example for those who will come after me. And so it's just kind of a nice little hopeful thing that no matter what barriers you think you're finding or you, or you know that are in your way, um, just know that there's other people you know, that's gonna come after you that, that may need you to push through so that they can succeed as well. So that kind of helped push me along. Mm -hmm. 
I know it's hard. Um, you, a lot of us know that you, you can't do this alone, you know, and you need a community behind you to kind of help support you along the way. And I think several of us on the call had that while we uh, were taking the tests and things like that. And I know, Sam, I think, you know, you had a community that you were involved with that helped you with the exams. Yeah, I did. Uh, like I mentioned, my AIA chapter helped me get my foot in the door. Um, it helped me to understand what I was about to do by saying I'm going to go pass all these architecture exams um, <laughs> because it, it's hard to really put into perspective the work that comes with it. Um, so meeting people who are also studying and preparing, getting ready for these tests, uh, it, it was a great community. Just we're meeting up once a week after work and occasionally on weekends. And uh, I I got to learn how hard people were studying and, and how much effort was going into it. When I actually attempted my first couple tests, I did not pass at all. Uh, I don't think I came close, but it at least got me on track to thinking like, okay, this is what it means to sit down in Prometric and take one of these exams. And uh, I proceeded to fail a couple more times after that. And it wasn't until I got involved with the ARE bootcamp community that I, I took that paid course and met up with another group of people across the country who are studying for similar exams as me. And what I really took away from doing the boot camp was understanding the I wasn't doing enough and that's why I was failing. I, I was really just trying to read the material and study things from a list and I wasn't absorbing it in the correct way. I wasn't putting in the needed hours uh, to really understand it and live it. And once I started putting a lot of the practice questions I was dealing with into real world, real world terms, then things started clicking a lot better. Uh, the, the tests are written to help reflect some aspects of what we do professionally. Obviously, we all live very different professional lives, but uh, getting to study in groups with people who experience architecture in a very different way than me can explain if I don't have good CA skills, maybe a person I'm studying with, that's all they do is CA related work. And they can explain some of the concepts that I'm not understanding. And so having a, a community of disciplined people of varying backgrounds helped me to, to push me to start passing my tests. And once I passed my first test, I proceeded to pass everything else beyond that and get to where I am right now. I mean, it's a, it's a good point. I mean, that we kind of brushed over in the beginning, but that, you know, most of these exams have about a 50% pass rate, more or less, you know, they mm -hmm. hover around that. So, um, you know, the idea of passing one after the other, after the other is it can, while it can happen, there will likely be, you know, some hiccups, um, along the way, um, for most people. So I guess that would be like, that's the next question is how, you know, how have you practiced bravery or resilience during the test taking? How have you kind of picked yourself up after maybe, you know, not passing? Yeah, I, when I was failing those tests, it's definitely heartbreaking. Uh, and whenever I would talk to other people who had gone through the experience, they're just like, yeah, it's kind of part of it. <laughs> like, um, I, I don't, you might find some outliers of people who passed every test on their first try, but it's not the normal. Uh, most of us who've gone through the experience have failed one or two, maybe a few uh, along the way. And it really feels like it's something kind of built into the system where um, it, you're gonna fail a test and you're gonna get really discouraged and being down. And then you're gonna say, you know, I still want to do this though. And, and that perseverance and picking yourself back up and, and continuing to study and continuing to try again is a very important part of 
finishing and and being able to call yourself an architect. I agree, Sam. I think conviction is 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 a word that comes to mind. You need to like to to become an architect. You do have a have you have to have a certain level of conviction or a certain level of like I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think that in terms of community, in 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 my scenario, I I was a part of Noma, so I had a community, but within that community, we didn't have a true structured uh, group that was focusing on um, the exams. Um, we, we have our summer camp and that's like one of our biggest things that we, we did at the time back in 2017. Um, and it still is now, it's still the, the major thing that we focus on, on getting um, you know, middle school to high school students in inner city to understand what does it mean to become an architect? But I felt that after NOMAS with NOMA students, there really, it kind of fell off. There wasn't a very structured program for individuals coming out of school and then helping them um, get their licenses. And, and, I, and I see that in, in sometimes a, a lot of areas where people just seem lost in this process. And so that's when I, um, after one of the general body meetings, I, I created the, the developing professional group and I tried to provide in this group, um, you know, all the things that I, I felt like some people felt was lacking in terms of support, which was a place for mentorship, a place for seminars for each exam where we kind of come together and we go over practice exams, um, uh, a place where you can gain uh, financial aid for your exams, as well as um, testing materials, study materials, practice exams, and things like that. Um, one of the things I want to key in in terms of like community and what that meant for me um, running the program. I, I always, I used to also like run a lot of the uh, seminars. So I would like look at the exams. I would, I would, I would pull pieces from different testing practice exams and come together. And we would all have a study session about these questions. Like some of the most difficult questions for a particular exam, say PPD or, or PA or something like that. And what I, I'm going to steal a quote from um, Greg Kochanowski. I hopefully I'm getting his name correctly with uh, GGA. He, he had a recent article with Arc Daily and this quote stood out to me. He said, what I love, uh, partly says, partly what I draw from in the new role is my 25 years in academia. Teaching isn't what I do. It's who I am as a person and a professional. What I love is that it's a process of having to clarify for yourself what you know in order to communicate that to someone else sometimes resulting in realizing how much you don't know, which opens up new potentials and ways of seeing things. So as I was doing those study sessions and leading them, even though I had failed some exams, I had passed some exams, I was learning stuff all the time. I was learning stuff from other people. And as you teach, you find out what you don't know. And you also find out what you do know and you solidify what you do know. So even if you're not running a big seminar program like that, I also used to Right before an exam, I would, you know, grab some beers with a close architecture friend. Even if if that person wasn't taking that exam, I'd just pull 20 questions. I'd, I'd get some beers for me and my friends, and we would go over the questions, and we would chop it up and have a good time. And it would be like a, a couple of days before the exam. I'm not drinking before the, not <laughs> before the exam. I'm not encouraging y'all to do that. But I'm just saying those loose, comfortable conversations trying to teach other people who are not taking the exam and help them understand why the question is written the way it is, it, it did wonders for me. So hopefully that's helpful as, as well. Absolutely. You know, Barbara, do you have any thoughts on this question? So <clears throat> it's the bravery and resilience kind of what, mm -hmm. um, so I guess I uh, maybe an unpopular uh, answer I would say would be actually for me I think at first I started by asking a bunch of people what they've done and thinking that that was going to be the re best route like I just wanted to know basically how to even start so I was since the moment I kind of started the entire process I was like I don't even know what ARE stands for I don't even know what ARE is I didn't even know how many exams consisted of it. I didn't know there was a California specific exam. I knew nothing. I was coming completely like new to this whole process. So I started by asking questions 
by trying to ask people who were in the process. And to be honest, I got bombarded by a lot of information. There's a lot of information out there with ARE study materials, with the Facebook uh, group um, for the ARE study uh, group. I read all the forums. So I was just trying to immerse myself. And I think I did it a little too much where now I just had a bunch of information and I did not know how to organize it or where to start. And I guess I was just feeling like there were so many different avenues and I didn't know it was going to work best for me. So I decided to kind of just start and I just started taking exams kind of blindly. Um, and I think I also, you know, started off just by purchasing one set of study materials and thinking that that was going to be enough because again that's what I kept hearing a lot of people were just like you're just going to need this one study material you'll be fine just do that read it and go off and take your exam like that's how I did it like you should be and I did and I went ahead and I did something that worked for somebody else but it didn't work for me and so something that I've been trying to practice it's easier said than done would be to try to not get so um uh what's the word um so I've taken three exams failed three so that's kind of disheartening you know you're barely starting off you think you're gonna be doing or passing the exams because you're listening to all these people who have told you do the study questions do the quizzes you'll be fine you'll pass um and that's not happening so I took this last month to kind of really realize and hash out like, okay, what is it really that's going to work for me? I don't think that study, like just one study material is going to do it enough for me. That's, a, it's clearly not, it hasn't been the case. And so I've been trying to understand what I've been doing wrong. And I think some of the things that I did do wrong now that I look back on it, first off was that I was cramming. I was really just thinking that I could cram, that I could just read this one source that had all this information on this one section, and I was going to be able to go off and take the exam. That did not work. Another thing that I realized that it just didn't work for me was multitasking. Um, I'm apparently not a good multitasker. I am definitely someone who has to monotask. I need to concentrate on one exam at one time for a month, probably, to then be conscious enough and actually study and actively study. Um, that was another thing that I don't think I was actually doing. I think kind of how you mentioned it, um, Sam, you were just kind of reading and highlighting, but that isn't really studying. And so that was another thing that I think I was doing wrong. I was disorganized. I didn't have some clear study goals either. A lot of people were telling me what to do. A lot of people were telling me their study goals but they didn't work for me. And I wasn't actually seeing how I could tie them to myself and to my personal way of studying. And I also think I had a very unrealistic study pace because again, I was listening to forums where they were like, I passed all of my exams, got licensed in two months. And I was over here thinking that I was gonna be able to do the same. And so I guess a way that I've been trying to practice resilience is by understanding that what I read in forums, what I hear from other people kind of take it with a grain of salt and understand that that could work for them, but you should really do what's best for you and stick to it. So once you find, you know, whatever worked for you. So Matthew, you know, you touched upon like going out for beers and hanging out with friends and just talking about it casually. That seemed to really, really work for you. Sam, you had, you know, your group and study group and group of people to kept like kept you accountable. That really worked for you. I don't know what's going to work for me, to be honest. Like, I think I'm barely getting back into the study session again, probably going to start actively studying until September. But um, yeah, I'm just really trying to realize one, what even is, what are my study goals? And then once I accomplish certain study goals, be sure to kind of reward myself. And I think that's going to keep me on schedule. And another thing too, is like not following somebody else's schedule, but following my own. I think I really need to sit down and create my own study schedule of how I want to go about things. And then once I have that down, 
block out all the noise, block out what everyone has told me. Oh no, you should be doing this exam first. You should be studying that also. You should take, why are you only taking that exam three months? Like, why are you taking three months to study for an exam? Like, it's a very personal path, I think, at this point, something that I've realized. So I'm just going to stick to what works for me. I haven't found that, but I think that's something that is going to keep me from getting so disheartened when I fail and when I don't pass an exam. I, I totally agree, Barbara. That and that that's the that's the key. I mean, I had a lot of people who told me the way that I was thinking of it because I know how I am. Mm-hmm. So when I first came into it, I said, I'm gonna take every exam from beginning to end. I'm gonna take one, two, three, four, five, six. And mm-hmm. I was sold on doing it that way. And so I had created a vision in my head of how I wanted to do it. And no one could tell me that, like, tell me different. Mm-hmm. So other people was like, oh, no, you got a group like, you know, PA, uh, uh, P- PPD, PPD, PJM and, and CE together. And you do those clumps and then do the PA, PPD and PDD. I was like, no, I I'm going to do it mm-hmm. sequentially. And that's how I did it. Like and, and I, I actually enjoyed I felt that it worked well for me. Um, another thing that that, you know, people told me it was uh, you're going too slow, you know, mm-hmm. like Matt. You're, you're really bright. You know, you'll be, you'll pass the exam. Just, just book it for tomorrow and you'll be fine. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Like, I, I like to be very particular and meticulous about and very detailed about the things that I do. And I want to make sure I perfect it before I go in or I'll get flustered. So they may have been right that maybe there's some exams I could have, you know, passed in the next week. But what I do know is I was extremely confident and that's what you need to pass these exams. By the time you walk in that door, you need to be walking in there like, you know, when in WWE, when they like, like walking down the stairs and like, oh, you know, there's, there's, some, there's some like fireworks going. You're just like, I'm, I'm about to tear this test up. So that's, <laughs> you really want to be at that level. And like, just to speak on kind of my schedule, um, Barbara, um, what I did was something what I call as a soft study and a hard study. And so to keep myself sane, keep my mental wellness good, and to have my work-life balance and still be able to, you know, make it to a birthday or make it to a wedding or something like that, I would um, go to the NCARB handbook, say I'm doing PCM, I look at the list, I go through the entire uh, uh, section to see what type of questions they've got. Um, no matter what I, I do well on it or not is not important. I just go through it just to understand the information. Then I go to the back and see what's the list of recommended books. Then I, I go from those recommended books and then go on ARE 5.0 forms and just type in PCM pass ARE 5.0 community. And those, what's good about that community is that you know that um, nothing that's posted there is inappropriate because the moderators from NCARB moderate those forms. So no one is on there saying anything about the exams or it's taken down. So I know it's a safe space for me to read that information. Then I read what, um, what books people read and maybe some people line out some, some, some chapters based off some of the topics that were stated in the NCARB handbook. And then I have a shortened list of like maybe one to three books as opposed to that 20 book list in NCARB Now I'm shortening it down to about three major books. You know, if it's PA, you know, someone's, it's the the sustainability or it's the landscape book, the earth, wind, earth, I would call it the earth, wind and fire. I call it the earth, wind and fire book. It's the earth, wind and fire book. And you know, it's, 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 it's sunlight and wind or whatever or not. And so what, what I did was I would get those books and I would read them casually every day some for 15 minutes, an hour, whatever. I'm not highlighting. I'm not taking notes. I'm just reading like I was reading a novel, like as if I was reading a scary novel, whatever. And I'm just flipping through the book and I'm going pretty quick. I'm not trying to retain everything that I see. That's my soft study. And my soft study can be two months, two months of just reading random stuff. Once the hard study starts, which is the last month, that's where the ballast comes in. That's where the black spectacles practice exams comes. That's when I really start cramming the information. And by that time, I've seen the information already before. So my brain is going, oh, I've seen that diagram before. 
oh, I, I'm, I've seen this information about retaining walls. Now I'm studying about it, but I've seen it before. It's easy for me to pick it up. So by, I felt by doing the two months and the one month, it would take me three months to prepare for one exam. And that two month period allowed me to still have fun, still get my work done, still do all those things. Um, thank you for putting the sun, wind and light, but um, it's so funny. It's, I think people are going to remember and be like, oh, that's that earth, wind and fire, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think you touched upon a lot of really good stuff and just two things that for me came to mind. Like I was in currently still am like the ARE study program. And to be honest, this is what really helped me kind of gather and understand really what you need to do and read for these exams before this it's actually I think Steve Tanner's even on here um, hi Steve but he put together a study program which I'm a part of and that's when I really realized like yes you do need a lot of time to actually read this material to digest this material to really actively study the material and like you said then that's when after that once you've done and read these books that NCARB suggests on their matrix. Then you come in and do ballast maybe, or do black spectacles as kind of like a, a bump up to your studying. And whatever that takes you, whatever that takes you, you can set your own pace. And that's something else that I've learned from um, my coworker who she's done really, really well in the past. Like she's passed all her exams and she's taken her time and she's blocked out the noise. And I think that that's like one of the best ways to kind of go about it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I feel like I've done a lot of things wrong and I hope you can learn from what I've done wrong. But um, yeah, you bring up some really good points that it's really all about you and you set your pace and you set your own schedule and stick to it. Once you know what it is, like stick to it. Yeah, and I think also just what you're all talking about too, is learning about yourself in the process. Like I know one thing for me is that I realized I'm much more of a visual learner. So sometimes if I saw something, maybe I didn't understand in like the mechanical book as it's being written out, I would just, you know, go to YouTube and look at a little video or, you know, kind of find as much information as I could to help kind of grasp concepts that were, um, you know, as you were saying before, Sam, maybe not what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, um, that others do. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. I wanted to say on the subject of perseverance and, and accountability, because Barbara had talked about having accountability, that uh, when you find your group or if you connect with people who are also studying, uh, it's great to hold each other accountable. Um, mm -hmm. Telling your whole office, I'm going to take an architecture exam in three weeks and everyone wish me luck is like the worst form of accountability you could possibly do yes. because then you're going to have to walk through and tell everyone individually that you failed your test. And <laughs> that, that happened to me on that my is, exam. It was not good. It was the that, worst thing to walk in and everyone, how did it go? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> that, that is, it's very defeating. <laughs> I don't think it helps you in that situation. Um, so if you want to have accountability, hold two or three close friends or people who are going through the same process as you that understand uh, that you might pass or fail and that you should keep going no matter what the results are, um, kind of help Absolutely. teach you to dissociate yourself from like, hey, I'm prepared, I'm ready to take this test, and if I fail, that's okay too. Sam, that's a really good point of like going through the office and tell everybody that you're good. I would also, you know, caution everyone who is on this path to beware of false, I'm trying to think of the, the word for it. It's like a false, false encouraging feeling that you're, you're studying, but you're not actually studying. Like there was a time where I, I failed my, when I failed my first exam, I was telling everybody in the office that I was taking my first exam and all of the praise and the compliments made me feel like I was doing something, <clears throat> but I really wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't producing the, the level of rigor that is required to pass the exam. And so, or to even understand the concepts, I just figured it was like, 
I'll just read Ballas, similar to, to Barbara in her first exam. It's like that first experience and everybody's saying, wow, you're doing good. Or I'm studying at lunch or reading a couple of notes. Good job, Matt. You're going to you're going to kill it. And it's like it almost becomes like a little bit of a false encouragement. And so um, you can unconsciously um, make yourself feel good by like letting people know or, or getting amped up for it. But it's like it's sometimes a harder road to, to not tell anyone and to, to run that by yourself. And that's why it's important to have people who are really in the trenches with you, like Sam is talking about, like people who aren't taking the exam, they're going, oh, th them saying good job or I hope you do well is the same as them saying hello in the morning. They're going to forget about it. Like it's just like a part of the, the motions, but having the, the people that are studying and test taking with you they know what you're going through they're like your, your your brothers and sisters in this that's the family so those are the people you want to be talking to as opposed and that that circle may be very small maybe one person it may be two it may be five but i think that's a really good point sam it's like it's not the it's not the best way to get accountability it's not even the best way to get you encouraged you want to get encouragement from the people who've done it before and are on your side and they're they're cheering for you to win and they are able to provide help or those who are actually going through it at the time. Sounds like, you know, Barbara, you've kind of mentioned on this a little bit, a little bit, but what are your like current study plans and study materials when to block out all the noise and you think about yourself and how you study and learn? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a great question because I feel like I'm still I feel like I still I'm taking some time where um trying to figure it out but I guess again kind of going back to the first thing that I wanted to do was like all right what did I do wrong what was I doing wrong why wasn't I passing first thing that I was doing wrong one study material not going to be enough like I need to be realistic that's just not gonna like it's not going to be enough material in order to pass the exams so I can't just rely on one so now I'm not going to cram. I'm not going to just cram on one material. I am going to create a study plan per section. So for example, something that I did wrong, or I think not that probably I didn't do wrong, but I started off with PA because again, I heard that starting off with PA, the hardest ones was just going to be easier. You're going to get the hard ones out of the way first and then start with um, and end with PCM, PJM and CE. So I, I don't think I'm going to do that this time around. I think I'm going to start off in sequence and start off with like the easiest one and move up with the harder stuff, start with PCM. So I think now I am scheduling or planning to schedule PCM starting in September, probably study um, one to two months minimum, and then take that exam and then see how it goes. Um, Another thing that I've been hearing a lot about too is uh, the Amber book, which I still haven't made my decision on. It seems like it could be a great material source um, for somebody who is able to just study. Somebody who has eight hours in the day to dedicate to studying. Like I think that's probably when this resource would be best utilized. I still don't know if I'm going to have that luxury. I might not. So I might have to work 40 hours a week and then throughout that week, somehow study and add study time to that and not burn out. So I, depending on that, um, I think I'm going to keep going with first kind of how Matthew really talked about it. And this is how some of my coworkers who have passed successfully the exams have gone about it. They first start off with the NCARB matrix. They go through the list for the exam they're going to take. They read the books that are called out. They set up a study schedule depending on their reading pace. And then they set that out. They're like this first three weeks, I'm going to read this one book. And then this next week, I'm going to read this one book. And then they kind of do a study plan. And then they schedule their exam, even before studying. They're like, what's well, going to take me two months to study for the PCM. I'm gonna schedule my exam and then they start studying. They give themselves the two months they study and then they go off and take the exam. And so 
I think this might be a slower way to go about it, but I'm going to try this out. Maybe this is the pace that I need to go to kind of one, not burn out with work, with studying, with everything that's going on. And at the same time, dedicate enough time to actively study and setting a realistic study pace, which I think is everything that I didn't do my first go around with these three exams. Um, I had a lot going on at work. I was switching jobs um, when I was like in between two exams that I had scheduled. So I had scheduled my first exam in December. That wasn't a good idea. It was, you know, Christmas and New Year's. I did not study. I still took the exam, didn't pass. The next exam that I had scheduled was in February. And for that exam, I actually did study, but I only studied one resource. That wasn't enough. I rescheduled the exam in late April, and I had just gotten back from a two-week vacation in Europe. I didn't study. So being completely honest, being completely transparent, like I've realized that I just did not have good study habits. I did not have actual, like, actual study goals, um, and I wasn't setting an actual realistic study pace for reading all the material that was necessary for having this unrealistic idea that I was just gonna be able to read one resource and I was gonna pass. Um, just do black spectacles, you'll be good. Like, wasn't, wasn't enough. So I am gonna probably take it slower than what I've been doing. I'm gonna space them out. I'm gonna actually do study plans that work for me and, and take it exam by exam and just kind of reward myself through the process. I think this is what I'm gonna do from here on out studying back up in in September. Thank you. It looks like we're getting to the kind of quarter till and um, Matthew, thank you for typing in your resources there. I don't know, if, Sam, if you have any quick um, ads to resources that you'd recommend or study plans. Uh, a lot of what Matthew put in here are all very good. Um, like I had mentioned before, I use the boot camp. Uh, I would recommend just to do as many practice questions as you can. Uh, when you walk in on test day, uh, just because you're really good at reading 100 pages every night, that doesn't help you to pass a test. Um, you do as many practice questions as you can. Get in a rhythm of answering questions quickly. Uh, so we are designer hacks. Uh, the ELIF questions, um, the, I don't know, there's a handful out there, but uh, those are the ones I focused on and all of them are good. None of them are perfect. You don't have to focus on just doing one over another. Try to do as many as you can. Yeah, I would say one tip that I got that I do think was pretty good was that three months is about the time you should take because they said if you give yourself more time, you actually forget what happened before. And just like what you were saying, Matthew, then the crunch, there's a crunch time, right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, there's, you can, and you can set that yourself, but studying, you know, giving yourself six months to study for the exam, you're not going to remember three months later what you read two months before. So 